Well, greetings and on this Sunday, August 16th, and a warm welcome to all of you. We have some encouraging words from the writer of Psalm 62, who wrote, Trust always in God. Pour out your hearts before him. God is our shelter. I pray that each of us have our faith increased, our hope renewed, and our courage strengthened as we worship together. And may this be a time of inspiration for all. I do have a couple of announcements uh, before we begin our, our worship. Uh, this Sunday uh, evening at 6 p.m., New Disciples uh, will be holding a prayer service. Uh, their address is 610 32nd Avenue Southwest, and that's again uh, 6 p.m. tonight. And then this Friday, uh, a citywide uh, prayer gathering is being held. All churches in Cedar Rapids and Marion are invited. Uh, it will be held at Green Square Park uh, at 7 o'clock, and you're uh, welcome to bring a lawn chair for that event too. That should be a big one. But with the uh, events that have happened uh, this past week, I thought what I'd do is uh, share a familiar scripture passage with you uh, that uh, brings comfort and assurance to us, and that's Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside quiet waters, he restores my soul. He guides me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This past Monday began as a regular day, but then did we get hit with a storm. Most of us have probably never heard of this type of storm before, but it is officially called a derecho. Around noon hour, black clouds filled the sky, and here at the church, I heard the warning siren go off. Storms can come with advance notice, or they can surprise us unexpectedly. We were aware one was coming, but sure didn't expect a derecho with straight line winds blowing around 100 miles per hour. Along with these severe winds came fast moving, violent thunderstorms that also brought a heavy downpour of rain. Although officially called a derecho, this storm we experienced has been described in more familiar terms as an inland hurricane. The storm has left a path of destruction that will take a long time to clean up. Power lines are down, leaving the majority of our community and county without electricity for an unspecified amount of time. Trees uprooted from the severe winds have blocked streets as well as caused home and property damage. Crops were flattened in fields and if not permanently damaged, will be difficult to harvest. The strong winds have torn off roofs, ripped apart buildings, and even grain bins collapsed. This past week has sent a sharp reminder of how quickly and unexpectedly tragedy can come crashing into our lives. We live in a world where storms sweep in from nowhere and shake the ground beneath our feet. Derecos, earthquakes, tornadoes, and other natural disasters bring destruction. When a terrible tragedy strikes, we struggle for answers, reasons, and explanations. Who hasn't asked the question, how can a loving God allow such an awful thing to happen? Unfortunately, there is no simple, easy answer. 
In theological terms, the question of why God doesn't step in and prevent bad things from happening is called theodicy. We have been taught that God is all-powerful, so it seems to us that he can prevent evil from happening. Not only that, but we've also been taught that God is all-loving, so he must want to prevent evil from happening. And then, when some tragedy comes our way, we can't help but wonder why it has to be this way. Of course, a common answer to the problem of theodicy is that calamity strikes those who live in the wrong way. Several years ago, a state senator in Alabama spoke out after the Hurricane Katrina disaster. This senator claimed that the hurricane struck where it did along the Gulf Coast because Mississippi and Louisiana had legalized gambling. God had sent the hurricane to punish those states for their sin. A Methodist preacher in Alabama heard this senator's theory of hurricanes and responded, well, if the Lord was aiming for those casinos, then he needs to improve his aim. The hurricane took out about eight casinos and nearly a hundred Methodist churches. We may not be able to fully explain our suffering, but no tragedy can be ever taken as a sign of God's punishment. In the Old Testament, the book of Job addresses the problem of pain and suffering in our lives. It deals with the questions we have that we have when confronted with a catastrophe. Why? Why me? Why him? Why them? Job was a successful and wealthy man whose life suddenly collapsed very quickly. He faced the destruction of his property, the death of his children, and finally the loss of his health. Job suffered more tragedy than most of us ever do in our entire lives. During this time of his suffering, Job had an encounter with God. And in chapter 38, verses 1 to 11, the voice of God broke in, and Job is asked a number of questions. Tell me, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Where were you when I determined its measurements? Where were you when I stretched the line upon it? Where were you when I shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? Where were you when I made the clouds its garments and thick darkness its swaddling band? One unanswerable question after another until Job finally acknowledged that there is a lot about life he didn't know. There are many things that are beyond our understanding. God wants us to trust him, even when nothing seems to make sense. Job cried out for an explanation, but the book ends without one. We've all seen our share of tragedies, but in this life, there is a huge amount of undeserved and unrelieved suffering. A Chinese parable is told of a woman who lost her only son, she was grief-stricken out of all reason. Eventually, she went to see a wise old philosopher who said to her, I will give you back your son if you will bring me some mustard seed. However, the seed must come from a home where there has ne never been any sorrow. Well, eagerly, she started her search going from house to house. In every case, she learned that a loved one had been lost. Finally, the truth dawned on her. How selfish I have been, she said. Sorrow is common to all. Our painful questions about suffering find some relief in a psalm we are all familiar with in the Bible. Every time we hear it, the words of this psalm reminds us of a rock-solid, uh, timeless truth. In Psalm 23, 
God presents himself as our shepherd, treating us as his own flock of sheep. No matter how the world has changed, no matter how different things are, God promises he is with us. The 23rd Psalm has life-changing power. It can easily be memorized, but the power of those words come from thinking the thoughts. When we get stressed out, sometimes we'll forget about God and he cannot get through to us. Psalm 46 verse 10 tells us, be still and know that I am God. That is wise advice. By being still and quiet before God, we think things through carefully. Our tension withers away and we concentrate on seeking his guidance. This is why when we pray, it is important to be alone and still. The Lord is my shepherd. The word my in that statement makes all the difference in the world. The love a shepherd has for his sheep is obvious when we look at all that was done for them. In verse 5, we read, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. This represents the work of a shepherd, preparing the fields before letting the sheep out to graze. This included checking out the area carefully. At four o'clock in the morning, the shepherd would start grazing his sheep. By 10 o'clock, the sun was beaming down and the sheep were hot, tired, and thirsty. The wise shepherd knew a sheep couldn't drink when hot or if its stomach is filled with undigested grass. So the shepherd first made the sheep lie down in green pastures at a cool, comfortable spot. He makes me lie down in green pastures. That speaks of safety. A sheep won't lie down if there is danger. Even the laughter of a child will startle a sheep and it will stand up. If a sheep is lying down, that means the sheep is safe. In the evening, as the sheep were being corralled, the injured or sick ones were separated from the others. Then the shepherd bandaged up their wounds and restored them to good health. This is a great picture of what Jesus does for us. Repeatedly, Jesus helps people get started again. He restores human lives. He helps people get a new understanding of what life really means. Jesus heals broken lives and reaches out to tired, stressed out, discouraged people. We don't look for green pastures and still waters, literally, but like sheep, we do hunger for peace purpose, and security in an uncertain world. We look for the right paths to follow. Jesus tells us in John 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. We are the sheep who got lost in sin, but through his death on the cross, Jesus rescued us. While green pastures and still waters relieve stress, and recharges our body, only one thing can restore our souls. That is God's forgiveness. We can feed in the green pastures and drink of the still waters. We can get rested and refreshed, but there's more. By trusting what, God, what Christ did for us by faith, we have security. A risen Lord and Savior who conquered death and is alive forever. We know that he won't cut and run when the going gets tough or threatening. Psalm 23 assures us that our good shepherd, Jesus, is near. He restores our soul. We drink from his stream of living water which is the Holy Spirit leading and guiding us. Notice, we don't say, I am one of Christ's flock. 
but rather, the Lord is my shepherd. When we can say that, the gospel message has reached down into our hearts and fulfilled its mission. The cross is God's eternal sign that he cares for us. There was once a traveler who found himself lost on a quiet country road. He stopped by a farmhouse to ask for directions. An elderly woman sat on the front porch, rocking quietly and contentedly. A younger gentleman was working around the, the front yard, whistling nonstop. The whistling was loud and clear, a stringing together of one song after another. As the lost traveler approached the whistler for directions, he greeted him, greeted him with a smile and observation. I've been enjoying your whistling. Oh, it's second nature with me. Then pointing to the woman on the porch, he said, that's my mother. A few years ago, she lost her eyesight. Blindness became a very frightening experience for her and she was feeling very insecure. So I moved her in with us. I figured if I just keep whistling when I'm outside the house, working on the lawn or whatever, she'll know I'm still with her. Psalm 23 brings the assurance that God's presence with us is a fact in every circumstance of life. To know that one, all wise and all loving, goes ahead and sees the path more clearly than we can gives us assurance and courage. The message of Psalm 23 offers a positive, hopeful, faith approach to life. We're reminded that our Good Shepherd, Jesus Christ, is near at hand. This is a psalm for times when tragedy strikes, when we're feeling lost, helpless, alone, anxious, or fearful, in sickness, or when we're parted from a loved one and the pain and grief runs deep. We can be comforted knowing that Jesus relieves our fears. If your greatest fear is loneliness or rejection, Jesus has answered that. Through him, we have been so loved by God that nothing in creation can separate us from him. If you fear storms, like the Dereko, Jesus has the power to calm them with a word. Worried that your needs might not be met? Jesus has promised that his Father will meet our material needs. Fearful of death? Jesus has conquered it. Jesus said in Matthew 11, verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Know the shepherd. Know that he will never leave you nor forsake you. As we worship today, may you find the peace and joy which only the Lord Jesus, our shepherd, can give. Let's pray together. Gracious God, our true shepherd, in this quiet moment of worship, meet each one of us in just the very way we need you right now. As we recover from the devastating Dereko, grant that all may have their faith strengthened and hope restored. Help us to trust you, remembering the promises recorded in your word. May your comforting peace be with those who are experiencing distress at this time. We especially lift up those who are so frightened or discouraged that they are afraid of the future. We pray for our church during this coming week of cleanup, that all the work goes well and our place to worship be restored. Grant your spirit be with us so that our lives may be a reflection of your goodness. In the name of our shepherd, Jesus Christ, we ask this, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As God's Holy Spirit moves among us now, the risen Christ is inviting you to become his follower, his disciple. If God's Spirit is tugging on your heart today, urging you to respond to the invitation of Jesus, who asks, will you come and follow me? What an opportunity to give your life to Christ. Through disappointments, tragedies, and trials, through all the disappointments of life, Christ will go with you. The journey of faith begins when you confess your sins. Then, by faith, receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Jesus said in Revelation 3, verse 20, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. He is standing at the door of your heart, knocking, listening, waiting for you to respond. You're invited to pray along with me now. Dear Jesus, I know I can't save myself, so please forgive my sins. I ask that you come into my life. I want to know you and trust you. Amen. Come and experience the joy of life with the risen Christ. And now let's go meet the world which God loves and for which Christ died. Let us proclaim God to be worthy of our trust and Christ of our discipleship. Let us live as the heirs of Christ and the people of God in the midst of God's world. Amen.